Okay, so now let's talk about how we prepare ethers. Uh, the, the most common way is to just take a sample of alcohol, uh, so for example, ethanol, and add in a little bit of acid catalyst. So for example, um, you know, I don't know, some sulfuric acid, add a few drops of sulfuric acid, and that'll catalyze a reaction between those alcohol molecules. So let's see what happens here. What do we think is going to happen when we have an acid catalyst and an alcohol? Hopefully you guys have had this drilled into your head that the oxygen on the alcohol will go and accept that proton in a proton transfer reaction, right? And what is the whole point of that? Same as it's always been, that now makes that alcohol group a good leaving group and leaves the alpha carbon susceptible to nucleophilic attack, all right? So we protonate that alcohol group, just like we've seen over and over and over again for reactions of alcohols in the presence of acid. And then what's gonna happen is that nucleophile that's gonna do the attacking is just another alcohol molecule that's floating around in solution, right? So another ethanol molecule will reach around and play the role of a nucleophile attacking that electrophilic alpha carbon and kicking off that water leaving group. Okay, so first step would be a proton transfer, and then you have this SN2 style nucleophilic attack. This leaves us with this protonated ether here. So what's going to have to happen? Some base is going to come along and receive this proton. If you have a big solution of alcohol, it's probably going to be another alcohol molecule, and thus, you know, this will start this cycle back over again, right? That'll just wind this guy back up. In this position, once it gets protonated, ready to attack by an, be attacked by another alcohol, um, we'll accept that proton and thus creating our ether. So because of the preparation of this, this is kind of these solvolysis reactions where it's, it's the solvent itself that's doing the reacting, right? Again, I just have like a sample of ethanol or pentanol or something like that, and I add in some acid catalyst, and I let those neighboring one another. This is a great way to prepare symmetrical ethers. You wouldn't be able to do it. If you mix two alcohols together and tried this method, you wouldn't be able to selectively uh, create an asymmetric ether. You would get a mixture of two symmetrical ethers and your asymmetric, right? These two alcohols would react with one another as well as with a different type of alcohol. So bottom line, this only works for creating symmetrical ethers. If we want to create an asymmetrical ether, there's this special synthesis procedure called a Williamson ether synthesis. Okay, so this is where we would take an alcohol, you know, the whole idea being that our blue R is different from our red R in this reaction. So we take our uh, some alcohol, we mix it with sodium hydride. Um, if you look back at the, we haven't really talked too much about this. It's kind of showed up in our lectures, but we never spent, uh, I never spent some time talking specifically about it. You, when we first saw this, it was in our, it was in chapter uh, what was it, seven, alkyl halides chapter, because it falls uniquely under the category of a um, strong base, a strong base, but a weak nucleophile. Right, so these in, in, the, in the context of an alkyl halide, strong bases, weak nucleophiles, these will promote elimination reactions over substitution reactions. Um, we saw before these hydrides, this is, and this, that's what this is called, sodium hydride. We saw other hydrides before where the whole shtick was that the hydrogen was playing the role of a nucleophile. These are fairly similar with the caveat that it's not going to play the role of a nucleophile, it's going to play the role of a base. So the hydride ion, and that's what happens when you pair these with sodium, right? Sodium is going to give up that electron to the hydrogen, so hydrogen is going to be sitting there with this excess negative charge. And these react, these hydride ions react with acidic protons, and they're really strong bases. So we don't really think of alcohols as being all that terribly acidic. We know that the protons can be removed with a strong base, um, and that's exactly what we see here. This hydride will react with this hydrogen in order to form an alkoxide ion, right? So that's really what step one is doing for us here, is forming 
an alkoxide or a protonated alcohol. Uh, one of the reasons why this is so great is because look what's going to happen when this hydrogen reacts with this hydrogen. It's going to form hydrogen gas, which is, a, of course, a very entropically favorable product to form because it's a gas, right? So not only do you create two molecules, you know, you have this extra translational energy. Because it's a gas, it can actually float away from solution. Lots of disorder there. So this would be a very entropically favorable reaction. So now we've got, right, this is our alk oxide. And then we're just going to turn around and react that with an alkyl halide, right? That's what this guy is here. This is an alkyl halide. And what happens when we have our alkoxide ion with an alkyl halide? We're going to get an SN2 type substitution reaction, right? So that'll attack that carbon and kick off that uh, leaving halogen leaving group, okay? And then at the end, what we have is a nice alkoxide ion. I'm, I'm sorry, no, we don't. At the end, what we have is our ether. Okay, um, because this is going to be this SN2 style elimination, it's going to work well primarily with primary or methyl alkyl halides. If you have a secondary alkyl halide, it's not that it won't work, but you will have some com competition with the elimination reaction. Remember these alk oxide ions are strong nucleophiles, but they're also strong basis. So not like it's impossible, but you will have competing elimination reactions. Okay. Uh, what it does mean though, is when you look at your product and you're trying to figure out how to, how to synthesize this, for example, you could have two different paths, right? You either start out with this out, you know, so my goal is to, I don't know what this, the MTB, um, methyl tert, you, Butyl ether, yeah, whatever. Uh, point being is that this is my product and I wanna to get to it well. I can either think of it as this half is my alcohol, the other half is my alkyl halide, or this half is my alcohol and the other half is my alkyl halide. So which one of these paths would be preferable? Well, I need my alcohol to go in and attack, right? After I create that alk oxide ion, the alcohol is gonna be the one playing the role of the nucleophile, which means that I wanna pick the other one, my alkyl, uh, alkyl halide to be the less sterically hindered so I can get a nice efficient substitution reaction, right? So these would be my two options. Which one of these is gonna be more favorable in terms of being a substitution reaction? It's gonna be the top one, right? The bottom one, I have a very sterically hindered halide, which is not going to substitute very efficiently. Okay, so that's just something that you want to keep in mind when you're doing the synthesis of these ethers. Another way to prepare ethers. Okay, so these are something we learned before about uh, oxymercuration and demercuration to an alkene. And what we did is when we used water in the second step of these reactions, we create an alcohol. Right. Um, these were these Markovnikov regio selectivity, right? Because I'm creating that alcohol group on the more highly substituted carbon. Um, and this was one of the ways that we learned how to generate alcohols from alkenes. Uh, your, your Wiley plus homework actually kind of prepped you guys for what's about to happen here, which is we can do the same thing, but instead of using a water, we toss in an alcohol. And then instead of producing an alcohol, we will produce an ether. So same reactants as before, you need your mercury acetate. Um, and then instead of using water, you'll use some alcohol and then follow that up with the sodium borohydride, which will replace the mercury with that hydrogen there. This wasn't one where we, I made you uh, learn the reaction mechanism. Other than to note that A, it is Obnikov, also an anti addition. Um, note that, you know, I, I, one thing that I want to say um, I've gotten a lot of students who have said stuff along the lines of this is like getting kind of crazy. There are a lot of reactions to uh, remember, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and in addition to all these reactions, there's these mechanisms, there's the stereoselectivity, the regioselectivity, everything like that. The most important thing that you can that you need to know for this class is to be able to recognize what substrate and what reagent will produce what product. That is 80% of the battle. Okay. Make sure you have that down first, flashcard it, do whatever you need to do. That's the most important part. Okay. Um, yes, knowing the Markov that it's regioselective and is important. I tell you to know the me mechanism, I would definitely make sure to do that. But the first thing you need to be able to do, the real majority of the battle is this right here. Because yes, it's an anti-addition, which could have stereochemical implications if two stereocenters were created. But here that wasn't the case. So the fact that it was an anti-addition doesn't really matter. It, would, it only matters when there are two new stereocenters that are created. That's when you're going to get two of the four possible diastereomers. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would go back to uh, the chapter eight. Yeah, the alkenes chapter when we were talking about all these addition reactions, when they generate uh, new stereocenters, all that good stuff. But more, most importantly is just knowing the substrate, reagent, and product patterns. Okay. Um, usually we would have a separate set of lectures on the reactions, but ethers again are relatively unreactive. So there's only one reaction that we have to worry about for ethers and it's how apart. It's not even like they're very useful. It's just going the opposite of what we did with our acid catalyzed formation. This is now acid catalyzed cleavage of these ethers. The one difference is, is that we're gonna make sure to use these um, hydrohalogen acids, right? So HCR, uh, I think it's actually HBr. Yeah, it's only HBr. Uh, hydrobromic and hydroiodic acid that will work really well. Those are the strongest of those hydrohalogen reactions. Um, so basically you can't just use any old um, sulfuric acid kind of catalyst. You want it to be one of those hydrohalogens because we're going to see that the, that halide ion ends up playing a key role here. All right, so what's the first step? Well, much like when we, what, what happens was our first step when we had an alcohol in the presence of acid. Remember, ethers aren't that much different than alcohols. They can't form hydrogen bonds, but they still have the, that hydrogen, which can play the role of a base and accept a proton from a strong acid. All right, so proton transfer is going to be the first step. The ether is protonated. Uh, when you have a protonated ether, it's called an oxonium ion. Okay, and just like when we protonated alcohols, the reason that we do that is because that will make that a good leaving group. So now that halide ion is going to play the role of a nucleophile, pack that carbon of our ether, and kick off that good leaving group. So after one round, we have formed an alcohol and a new alkyl halide. Okay. Uh, and then we can do one more step. So what happens when we have an alcohol in the presence of an alkyl halide? Uh, not an alkyl halide, uh, you know, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. Again, we're going to protonate that alcohol. And then that halogen can come play the role of a nucleophile and kick off that protonated good leaving group, creating a second alkyl halide. And now we get water. Okay. Um, like I said, this works with hydrobromic and hydroiodic uh, acid the best. Those are the stronger acids. Um, this will be an SN2 mechanism if you have a primary or secondary R group. If you have a tertiary R group, then you'll get an SN1 type mechanism, right? Because you can form those nice, stable tertiary carbocations. One thing we do, one thing to keep in mind though, is because it relies on a substitution, your R group has to be a substitutable carbon, an sp3 hybridized carbon. So something like an aryl or a vinyl will not work because, so this would be an example of an aryl group here. This carbon is sp2 hybridized. It cannot be substituted. So we'll be able to kick off this group using that excess hydrobromic acid, for example. But then when we get to this alcohol here, we won't be able to go yet another round 
of acid, cleav acid catalyzed cleavage because we don't have a substitutable sp3 hybridized carbon there. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind in terms of whether or not you get the full cleavage of your ether into two alkyl halides or if you get stuck with an alcohol and an alkyl halide as in this case here. All right, so just to summarize, same, same sort of summary that we always do. Um, what mechanisms do we have to know? Um, we want, you wanna know the mechanism for the acid catalyzed formation as well as the acid catalyzed cleavage of these ethers. And I also want you to know the mechanism for the Williamson synthesis of the ethers, right? How we form our asymmetric ethers. You don't have to know the mechanism for the oxymercuration. It's actually called an alkoxymercuration when it's an alcohol that you use instead of water, but whatever. Okay, um, regioselectivity is something that's kind of specific to um, addition reactions. And so, there is regioselectivity with our addition reaction here. It is Markovnikov. Um, the other thing that I will say, it's not quite regioselectivity, but I, I wanna put it in here anyway as a reminder. And that is with regard to the Williamson synthesis and the difference between the two R groups. Your red R, this one here, that's originally in your alkyl halide. Let me actually make that even more red. The red R of the alkyl halide should be easily substitutable. All right, so first of all, that means it has to be sp3 hybridized, and then methyl is better than primary, is better than secondary, and tertiary is just not going to work. Okay. Um, yeah, because if you have a tertiary, I know the tertiary are substitutable through SN1 type mechanisms, but in the presence of an alkoxide ion, all you're going to do is get the elimination product. Okay, and then the last one that we worry about is stereo selectivity. Um, Again, when we're forming ethers, fortunately, we don't have to worry about it because that oxygen is not going to go center. So don't have to worry about it here or here or here. When it comes to um, the addition type reactions, the one thing that we have to keep in mind, again, is that it's going to be an anti-addition. And so this could potentially uh, lead to a stereospecific products if I create two new stereocenters. So in this case here, because this was a hydrogen, I didn't create two new stereocenters, so I don't have to worry about it at all. But if I did create two new stereocenters, I'd have to keep in mind that it's going to be an anti-addition. Remember, that means that just like what's sort of drawn here, that means that that alkoxy group is going to be on the other side, uh, on the other side of that double bond attached from the other side as opposed to the hydrogen. And again, there's no stereocenter generated here because these are both hydrogens on that carbon. So don't have to worry about it. Okay.